Hello there, United States history students. I certainly hope that you are having a wonderful day. This is the second part of our recorded slideshow lectures on Western expansionism. In the first part, I talked a lot about the motives and the causes for Americans spreading westward to settle the lands in between Missouri and California in the late 19th century and the environmental and cultural impact. And more specifically, how the West developed a different type of culture than you would find east of the Mississippi. In this second part of the lecture, I'm going to focus more on the conflicts that occurred between the Native Americans and those Americans who are immigrating westward. All right, this is United States History with Mr. Endress of Upper Arlington High School. All right, hey, let's learn something. Okay, so for the remainder of this recorded slideshow lecture, I would like to talk about the experience of the Native Americans who lived in these western areas, and specifically the plains, as the Americans encroached from the east, absorbing this land into the United States of America. Now, the story is going to be a story of repeated conflicts, of repeated treaties, and repeated treaty violations. Now, did it have to be this way? Was this an, an inevitable conflict? At the dawn of the 19th century, we had Lewis and Clark, who led the Corps of Expedition from St. Louis to Oregon. And Lewis and Clark, and the president at the time, Thomas Jefferson, they had a particular vision for the future of the United States of America. All three of these white men wanted to see the United States of America expand to become a continental empire stretching from sea to shining sea, but all of them had envisioned the perpetuity of the Native American nations. Their vision of the future United States of America centered around trading posts. These would be cities that would be built along the Missouri River and the Columbia River and elsewhere throughout the West. These trading posts would provide white Americans with a place to live and a place to stay, they would be protected by the United States Army. The Native Americans would continue to have their lands in the West, but they would have the opportunity to come to these trading posts to trade with the white people and acquire goods that they themselves would value. Goods like sugar, coffee, flour. And Lewis and Clark and Thomas Jefferson all believed that by setting up this system of trading post cities throughout the West, the United States would expand from sea to shining sea the United States would incorporate all of what is today the United States of America, and that there would be continued existence of Native American nations that would be on peaceful terms with the federal government in Washington, D.C. They would still be technically on United States soil. That was the dream. That was the vision of the President of the United States and Lewis and Clark at the dawn of the 19th century. So what happened? Well, quite simply, in the West, resources were discovered that the Americans wanted. Gold, silver, bison, beaver, land that people could farm. And so, quite simply, here come the white Americans from the East to take over the Native American lands in the West and to deprive the Native American nations of their homeland. Now, you can define this in a couple of ways. You can define this movement in terms of the greed of white people. The white Americans simply weren't content to stay east of the Mississippi. But you could also define it in terms of survival. I mean, the Americans who did leave the United States of America and venture westward, west of the Mississippi, west of Missouri, to go into Native American land, these were largely poor people. These were people trying to find a life for themselves. And some of them saw Native Americans as simply standing in the way of them being able to discover gold, for example. But however you personally think of this original cause of white people spreading westward, the white people justified their actions through racist ideologies. I mean, it doesn't really matter if you're talking about the 19th century or the 21st century. As human beings, if you choose to be mean to another person, you tend to want to justify yourself, to say, no, I had a reason to do this. And in the 19th century, those reasons can fall under the concept of what, we've call, what we call manifest destiny. Manifest destiny 
is the abstract concept that it was the fate for white Americans to both possess and to civilize all of the land in between the Atlantic and the Pacific, or at least the Atlantic where the original 13 colonies were all the way over to the Pacific Ocean. And the concept of civilization was the white man's concept of, this, of civilization with personal property, with cities, with churches, with stores, etc. And for many white Americans in the 19th century, that was an enticing and exciting vision for them. They would look westward to the territories of New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, all of this. And it was exciting for them to dream of how they would one day conquer this and rule this and uplift and civilize this. But of course, the tragedy of all this is white Americans were in this, in this vision were being ignorant of the vibrant cultures, the many languages and nations of the Native Americans who lived in this area. This is a terrible story of loss. Could we have lived peacefully and coexisted, the Native American nations and the white Americans of the United States and their concept of civilization? Could this have happened? Well, this is sadly a big hypothetical because by the time we reach the 20th century, native cultures and many native peoples have been destroyed. And the story of the conquering of the West in the late 19th century is the story of that destruction. Probably the single most important cultural difference between Native Americans and white people is the concept of property. The Americans believed in ownership they believed that they could buy a slice of the earth, and Native Americans did not believe in this. Now, I assume that you believe in this as a resident of Upper Arlington. So think about your home right now. You've got a, or your family has a plot of land. This is your property. There's an address to it. Your home is on it, and that belongs to you. And if somebody you know, comes on to your property, that might cause a little bit of disruption, especially if they want to come into your home uninvited. Now, this concept of civilization goes all the way back to agriculture. When people started farming land, then they could live in one place and stay there for a long time. So concepts of property and property ownership you started to develop. You could build a home. You could have a town. That concept is built around farming. So the Native Americans of the Plains, they didn't believe in having farming. Or, I'm sorry, they didn't believe in having property. They didn't believe you could buy a slice of the earth and call it your own. And this is because they were mostly, but not exclusively, hunter-gatherers. They did practice farming, but not to the extent that they could build towns around agricultural development. So it would have been very interesting to grow up a Native American in one of the Plains tribes, because you would live like you see in this particular image here, if you're looking at your screen and able to see this, you would live in a teepee, which is a structure that you can put up and take down, and you could move from place to place to place following either animals or following the seasons. Now, this isn't to say that there weren't more permanent lodges that the Native Americans built throughout the plains. But as a whole, the Native Americans in the plains were far more migratory. They followed the seasons, they followed the food. So their concept of home was probably very different from what your concept of home is. Now for the Native Americans of the plains, the single most important animal was the bison, misidentified by early Americans as a buffalo. A buffalo is native to Africa. The bison is native to North America. At the dawn of the 19th century, there were 30 million bison in North America. When they would stampede, the earth would thunder. And the Native Americans would originally hunt them on foot. The Native Americans did not hunt the bison until they acquired horses from white Americans. It was obvious, obviously a far more difficult expedition to go out and hunt bison on foot. And when the bison was killed, the Native Americans used absolutely every single part of it for either food or to create tools out of. The bison was essential 
to the existence of the Native Americans on the plains. Which is why, as more and more white Americans ventured westward, wanting to take the land from Native Americans, the white Americans would conduct indirect warfare on the Native Americans by simply killing as many of the bison as possible, thus driving many of the Native Americans into near starvation. The bison themselves went almost entirely extinct by the early 20th century, when there were only a few hundred left. Today, the bison are a protected species. There are approximately 25,000 of them in the United States, which is good, but it's nowhere near the original 30 million that were around here 200 years ago. Now, two men in the United States government who are partially responsible for the decimation of the buffalo, or the bison rather, are these guys. President Ulysses S. Grant and his friend and fellow war hero, William Tecumseh Sherman. Hopefully you remember from the Reconstruction lecture that Grant believed that one of the best ways for the United States of America to move past the carnage and the terribleness of the Civil War was economic development. And for Grant, that meant spreading westward. Complete the Transcontinental Railroad. Get the gold, get the silver, get the copper, increase trade. As Americans spread westward and acquired more land, more money, then that would make the Civil War an event of the distant past. William Tecumseh Sherman believes in that vi vision, and Sherman, in particular, wants to get the Native Americans out of the way to complete United States' manifest destiny. And if you remember, Sherman became very famous at the end of the Civil War for the destruction of Atlanta and the destruction of Georgia and South Carolina. Sherman had waged total war. He believed that the best way to win the war was simply to destroy all transportation networks and all resources, all goods. So don't just kill Confederate soldiers, destroy their livelihoods, burn their property, destroy their stuff. That's the way to wage war. Of course, Southerners thought that this was barbaric, but it worked. And Sherman has that same attitude when it comes to approaching the Native Americans. And the best way to do this, thinks Sherman, is to kill all the bison. If you kill all the bison, the Native Americans will come crawling to you, begging for food. And then you've got them where you want them, and their land is yours. This was brutal, but this is what happened. Now, the United States government did little to actually help hunters kill all the bison, aside from having the United States military provide them with ammunition to do so, because there was already a bison trade happening. In the year 1870, a hunter could earn 300, or I'm sorry, could, a hunter could earn $3.50 for each bison hide that he collected. Now, this was good money. So remember, as you've got more and more people going out west looking for ways to make money, one of the ways that you can make money is to kill the bison. So just like there are men going west looking for nuggets of gold, there are men going west to kill bison to make their money. And competitions developed between who could kill the most bison. And what you're looking at here is an image of the man who is remembered for killing the most bison. And he earned himself a nickname because of this. Buffalo Bill Cody, who supposedly killed approximately 4,200 bison in a year and a half. Shooting bison became a sport People would carry guns on trains, and as they would be on a train, let's say the Transcontinental Railroad going through the West, they would pass bison herds, and they would just stand on the train and just shoot them for fun because they thought it was fun to watch them fall. And this type of behavior led to the near extinction of the bison, and it also created immense suffering among the Native Americans. Without the bison, they could not continue their traditional way of life. The best they could do is go collect bison bones that were, be, that were left on the prairie. And they could sell these bison bones to white farmers who could grind them up and use them as fertilizer. And increasingly, there were more and more farmers settling the West. The settlement of the West had largely something to do with the Homestead Act of 1862. This is a piece of legislation that was passed during the Civil War and it was a way to deal with poverty in the United States of America. The Homestead Act was very simple and quite an amazing piece of legislation that would never get passed today because we simply don't have the, the land that we had back then. Essentially, what the Homestead Act of 1862 did was this. 
the United States government identified 500 million acres of land in the plains. Yes, this land belonged to Native Americans, but the United States federal government simply didn't care. They said, we've got this land, it's ours, it belongs to the United States, we can do it with it whatever we want. And they broke this immense amount of land into 160 acre parcels. And they said, anybody can have one of these parcels of land if you agree to live on it and to farm it for five years. So remember, an acre is about the size of a football field. Think of getting 160 acres for free, but you got to build a house on it. You've got to farm that land and you've got to live there for five years. That would have been an amazing deal. That would still be a very amazing deal to get it today. That much land. You just have to live there for five years and farm it. Now, of that 500 million acres, by the time you get to the dawn of the 20th century, only 80 million of those acres have been claimed. Why wasn't all of it claimed? I mean, this is free land. Why wouldn't people claim it? Well, because people, this was for poor people to go west, to settle the west, and to expand the United States of America. But you still had to have the capital and the skills to build your farm, to buy farming equipment, and to actually farm the land. You know, even if you get the land for free, you're still going to need some money to be able to buy those things. And you're still going to need skills to be able to do that. And not every American had those things. But it would have been homesteaders like these that the Native Americans would have tried to sell bison bone to. It would have been homesteaders like these that the Native Americans would have seen as taking their land. It would have been homesteaders like these that the Native Americans would not have understood. Families living together in a home, a permanent home, growing food. This would not have been part of the Native Americans' way of life at all. They hunt for their food. They follow the food, such as the bison, wherever they go. They move with the seasons, and they live communally. They live in tribes. Whereas if you're a white person, you're born of the family, and you're like, that's my mom, that's my dad, this is my family. If you grow up a Native American on the plains, you obviously have your mom and your dad, and you most likely know who those people are, but you're going to be raised by the entire tribe. Very different from the way the white people raise their children. Think of this to drive the point home. In the culture of the Native Americans of the Plains, women and men really had separate spheres and did not intermingle that much. So there was essentially women's work and there was men's work. And part of women's work was doing the raising of children. And as children played, there would be a group of women that would monitor the play or be playing with them or be teaching them or doing whatever. And in traditional Plains Native American culture, Children would be breastfed for a lot longer than white children typically were breastfed. As a Native American, you might be four years old and still breastfeeding. That would probably seem strange to most white people. But think of this. As the kids are playing and there's a group of women standing around watching these kids play and monitoring the play and educating them and teaching them, and if one of the kids got hungry, it didn't matter which woman he went to for the breastfeeding. They were all his mothers. So we start with this idea of white people believing in property ownership and Native American people not and moving with the food and the seasons and living this tribal lifestyle. And you see how it creates these very different cultural differences and, in my own opinion, these fascinating cultural differences. But I say it really, or at least most of, most of these, these cultural differences can go back to property ownership, land ownership that white people believed in and Native Americans did not. Now, in the West, specifically in the region today that we would identify as southwestern South Dakota along the border of Wyoming, there is a beautiful natural formation that we call today the Black Hills. The Black Hills is obviously what we Americans call it today. It's not what the Native Americans called it. The Native Americans called the Black Hills the Paha Sapa. Paha Sapa stands for the heart of all that is. The Paha Sapa was the center of creation. When the earth was created, the Paha Sapa was the original creation. It's the navel of everything else. And this land is sacred. It's sacred and nobody is allowed to live there. You are allowed to visit 
but you are not allowed to stay. And because this land is sacred, because this land is holy, you would only tend to visit as a Native American for spiritual reasons. So one of the reasons why a Native American would visit the Pahasapa, the Black Hills, would be for what we call today a vision quest. And many of the people who would go on a vision quest would be teenage boys. So let's think about this. A teenage boy today, he starts to have to grapple with, well, what am I going to do with my life? What am I good at? Who am I going to be? Am I going to become a doctor or a lawyer or a mechanic or an electrician or a teacher? What am I going to do with my life? Who am I? And you try to answer these questions through well, school, talking about it, talking to your parents, your teachers, your guidance counselors, maybe a religious mentor. But the Native Americans of the Plains, they had a different way of answering this question. Here's what they would do. The Native American boys would venture into the Pahasapa, a place where they were not allowed to live, but they could visit, and they would go by themselves. They would stay there for about a week, probably about four, five, or six days. And while they were there, they would neither eat nor drink and possibly not sleep. So what happens to you when you're alone in the woods by yourself in a beautiful tract of nature and you deprive your body of the things it needs to survive? Food, water, sleep. Well, from the perspective of the Native Americans, here's what happens. You weaken your body. You weaken your body. You sap your body of its strength. And when you do this, it opens you up to visions. Nature, the earth and the sky and all of the plants and animals. These things are, for the Native Americans of the Plains, God. And nature provides you with visions. Perhaps the plants, the animals, begin communicating with you, talking to you. Perhaps you're overcome with powerful, image, uh, powerful imagery, incredible visions. And it is in this way that your life receives its meaning. You leave the Pahasapa with a vision of what you are to do with your life. You may also leave this experience with a new name. Several of the important Native Americans who I'm going to talk about in this story, individuals like Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, and uh, I guess I apologize, I, I can't use Sitting Bull as an example of this, so, but Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse was a Native American who received his name from a vision that he had, in which he saw, go figure, a crazy horse. Okay, so what we have here is an extraordinarily cultural difference between Native Americans of the Plains and the White Americans. Even though vision quests like these, we have examples of them in absolutely every culture and uh, in absolutely every religious tradition, but it's certainly not a central part of white Americans' traditions. And it was, and it was a very integral part of the, of, of the Native Americans of the Plains and, and their culture. And it also reveals how important nature was to the Native Americans. For most people living in the 21st century in Upper Arlington today, if you use the word God, that idea of God would imply for most people an entity, a being, that lives elsewhere, up in heaven someplace, and may or may not control events happening here on earth. For the Native Americans of the Plains, their concept of the divine, of something sacred, of God, would be much more terrest terrestrial, much more down to earth. For them, the trees are God, the birds are God, the animals are God, the earth is God, and worthy of respect and reverence. In order to understand the conflict between the white Americans, the Native Americans of the Plains, you have to understand the story of the Black Hills. Okay, so now let's focus on a particular nation of Native Americans in the Plains. That nation being the Lakota Sioux. Okay, so let me briefly explain these words. When European explorers were first exploring North America, the French explorers were among the first to interact with the Native Americans who lived in what would today be the Dakotas. And they called these group of people the Sioux. 
So if you look at that word Sioux, you're like, well, it looks, you know, there's a lot of vowels in there. It looks very French. You'd be right. So they were, the, the Sioux people were named by French explorers. Now, among the Sioux, there are two principal groups. There are the Lakota and there are the Dakota. Obviously, North and South Dakota are named after the Dakota. But there are the Lakota and there are the Dakota. And they are both part of the group of Native Americans that were identified as the Sioux. Okay, and then among the Lakota, hopefully this isn't getting too confusing here, there are seven sub-tribes. And one of those sub-tribes that comes up frequently in my telling of American history is the Oglala sub-tribe. And I specifically mentioned the Oglala Lakota Sioux because there are several important Native American warriors, specifically Crazy Horse, who were part of this specific group. Now, the Lakota Sioux as a whole had a reputation for being tough warriors going all the way back to the early 19th century with Lewis and Clark. When Lewis and Clark were planning their expedition out west to try to reach the Pacific Ocean, they were very concerned about the Lakota Sioux as being the group of Native Americans who would most likely kill them. So from the white person's perspective, going all the way back to the early 19th century, I mean, you're talking 1803 here, the Lakota were seen as vicious, violent individuals. Now, from their perspective, the Lakota would see themselves as the proudest, toughest defenders of their homeland and the least likely to be suckered in by the ways of the manipulative white people who wanted to steal their land. So, as the white Americans encroached on Lakota territory with the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, with the destruction of the bison herds, It was the Lakota who, throughout the 1860s, waged war on the United States of America. More trouble ensued when there was a significant gold strike in Bozeman, Montana. And the white white people trying to get to Bozeman to be part of the gold rush there followed a trail that cut cut right through the middle of Lakota Sioux country. Needless to say, the Lakota attacked them in response to this, the United States government under both the Andrew Johnson and Ulysses Grant administrations, established forts along the Bozeman Trail, forts like Fort Laramie, Fort Reno, Fort Massacre. And one of the Lakota war chiefs, who was seen as the one of the most valiant, toughest war ch- chiefs who fought the Americans, was this individual, Chief Red Cloud. And after multiple battles, it was actually the United States government that really wanted to have a p- peace treaty with Chief Red Cloud to bring peace among the Lakota and the United States. And the reason why the United States of America wanted to engage in negotiations and not just continue the warfare was because it was the 1860s, the United States of America was also building the Transcontinental Railroad. That was not yet completed. And the troops of the United States Army were simply spread too thin. So the United States, all they wanted was to provide a safety for all the miners going to Bozeman, Montana to be able to pass in peace and not be attacked by Lakota. That's all they wanted. So Chief Red Cloud finally agreed to a treaty. From his own perspective, this was necessary because he had seen the endless stream of white people. He had heard of magnificent cities in the East filled with millions more he was overcome with this sense of inevitability that they couldn't stop the, sp- the spread of white people from the East to the West. So Chief Red Cloud decided, decided to negotiate to get the best possible terms for his people, the Lakota Sioux. And that agreement ended up being the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. Now, just take a moment to think for yourself, if you're in Red Cloud's shoes and you want to make sure that your people the Lakota Sioux, get the land and get to keep the land that is most important to them and that white people stay off it, what land are you specifically going to identify? And of course, hopefully you're thinking, well, the Black Hills, the Pahasapa, the heart of all that is. And that was the one thing that he specifically identified. No white people in the Pahasapa. That is ours. And the United States government had absolutely no problem with that because they saw no value in the Black Hills. For the United States government, it was worthless land. For the Lakota, it's the heart of all that is. 
And so there is a particular phrase which is attached to the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. And I actually thought this, these words were in the Fort Laramie 1868 Treaty, but they are not. The, this is a phrase that has been used repeatedly going all the way back to an earlier Fort Laramie Treaty of the 1850s. But the spirit of the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty is the same. And the phrase is this. The United States government promises this land to your tribe for as long as the grass shall grow and the rivers flow. For as long as the grass shall grow and the rivers flow. Obviously, that phrase is supposed to suggest, rather poetically, for all eternity. This is yours. As long as the grass is growing and the rivers are flowing, that land, the Black Hills, is yours. It's very clear. Of course, today in the 21st century, those words are read with a cynical mindset because the United States of America broke nearly every single one of those treaties. But here's what Red Cloud won, Cloud won for his people. The entire western half of the modern state of South Dakota. This was a reservation. It was identified as the Great Sioux Reservation. The United States of America did not have too much of a problem giving the Lakota Sioux this rather large chunk of land because the government saw little to no value in that land. Now for the Lakota, this is a significant amount of land that they can hunt and fish on and possibly continue their traditional way of life. However, it is not the entirety of the plains. It is a serious reduction to the freedom that they once had. And not every Lakota agrees that they want to live on the Great Sioux Reservation. And now we get into another major cultural difference between the Native Americans and the white Americans. See, here in the United States of America, with our military and with our government, there are clearly defined leaders. So when I say, who is the president of the United States of America who represents us in diplomacy with other countries, you know who that individual is. Just like if you joined the military, if you joined, let's say, the Navy, and you're on a ship, and that ship has an admiral, you know who gives the orders on that ship. And there is a clear chain of command. So in our American culture, there are clear leaders, at least in government and the military, for the most part, there are clear leaders with clearly prescribed powers of authority. That's our culture. In Native American culture, it's not quite so clear. And the reason why it's not so clear is because the Native American cultures, including the Lakota Sioux, are far more free. There's far more of a premium placed on individual freedom. So among the Lakota Sioux, what earns you the right to be a chief is simply your ability to get other men to follow you into battle. So that's almost the entire, it's almost entirely opposite than the American way of life and the American culture. I mean, if you join the military in the United States, you know, if you decide to be a Marine and you go to Paris Island, it'll become very clear to you within seconds upon your arrival that you have no freedom that your superior is going to tell you what to do, and you darn well better do it, or there will be hell to pay. Versus the Lakota. A Lakota chief, if he wants to fight the Americans, has to stand up and give a great speech to the Lakota, explaining to them in no uncertain terms what's at stake if they don't fight the Americans, to inspire each and every one of those individual Lakota to grab his arms and follow you into battle. So there is a lot more freedom among the Lakota. Imagine this, you know, in our American culture, we're in school, you're a student, I'm a teacher, I tell you to do your work, and you've got to do it. Or there are negative consequences to not doing your work. If we were Lakota, and this might sound very enticing to you, it would totally be your choice to come to listen to me, to have me teach you. There was far more of a premium placed on your individual freedom. So there's a major cultural difference. Now, there might also have been a price to pay for this cultural difference. According to the very famous American historian who passed away in the early 2000s, Stephen Ambrose, 
Stephen Ambrose in evaluating the militaries of the Native Americans and specifically the Coda versus the American military of the late 19th century, he believed that the Native Americans were just as strong, if not stronger, than the United States military, that they could have won the Plains Wars. So why didn't they? For Stephen Ambrose, lack of organization. The Native Americans had too much freedom. Had more Native Americans been forced to fight in the same way that the American army was, there might have been a very different outcome to the Plains Wars. Okay, so how does this cultural difference in relate to the Great Sioux Reservation and to Red Cloud? Well, it related like this. When the United States government was in negotiations with Red Cloud, they thought they were talking to the one individual who represented the entire Lakota nation. But in engaging with these negotiations to sacrifice Lakota land, some of the Lakota warriors abandoned Red Cloud. They saw him as a sellout. And they began following other Lakota Sioux that refused to live on the reservation on principle. These were great chiefs like the older, more experienced Sitting Bull and the younger, enigmatic, energetic Crazy Horse. Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse were the anti-Chief Red Cloud, and the, United, and the people of the United States of America grow very upset when they have this negotiation. Chief Red Cloud acquires the Great Sioux Reservation and yet they're still getting attacked by the Lakota. The Americans are like, we had a deal here. But these other band of Lakota, they simply say, Red Cloud doesn't represent us. So the situation remains tense. And then another gold strike happens. Individuals who are following the Bozeman Trail from Nebraska up to Montana, they know the, chance of the chances of them striking it big in Bozeman, Montana are slim to none. So they start exploring some of the other creeks and rivers along the Bozeman Trail, and they strike gold. And the gold strike happened to be in probably the worst possible place for the Lakota. White people had ventured off the Bozeman Trail and gone all the way up into the Black Hills, where they found one of the biggest sources of gold in all of North America. The Black Hills are loaded with gold. You can hopefully understand right here how war between the Lakota and the United States of America is near inevitable. This gold strike happened in the year 1774. The president of the United States at the time was President Ulysses S. Grant. What would you do if you were in his shoes? You could honor the treaty. The Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, you could dispatch the United States military to guard the Black Hills for the benefit of the Lakota, and maintain respectable relations between your two nations. Or you could just turn a blind eye to it. Now the Lakota are going to clearly defend their land. They are armed with both bows and arrows and guns. They're going to do their best to kill those miners when they come into the Black Hills, but the miners are going to come in with the, into the Black Hills wanting to get that gold, wanting to get rich with their own guns. What are you going to do if you're Ulysses S. Grant? Well, for Grant, we simply have to look at where his interests lie. If you remember, in the year 1773, there was a stock market crash, so there's an economic depression. This is an opportunity for Americans to make money. Are you really going to stop them? Yes, the 1868 treaty is going to be broken, or if not broken outright, at least ignored. And again, Ulysses S. Grant believes that the best way out of the Civil War era and out of Reconstruction to bring harmony between the North and the South is for all Americans to become more prosperous, to make money. So I think I've set this up well enough for you. You know what move Grant is going to make. He is not going to stop the miners from going into the Black Hills. But what we have now is a war coming. There are two significant Lakota chiefs that we're going to learn that you need to learn about. The first is Sitting Bull, fierce, independent, tough warrior, scared at nothing, earned his name not as I erroneously said before uh, in a vision quest. He earned his name in battle. When the battle raged all around them, he stood still, unflinching, unafraid. He was as statuesque as a Sitting Bull. And he's remembered as one of the most revered and uncompromising of all the Native, Native American warriors. That was Sitting Bull. 
the younger and very enigmatic Lakota warrior of the Oglala subtribe was a man by the name of Crazy Horse. There is no known photograph of Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse never learned how to speak English. He he rarely interacted with any Americans. We have this one image here, which is a drawing made of Crazy Horse by a Christian missionary. Crazy Horse is one of the most iconic Native American warriors in American history. It's worth getting to learn his story a little bit. When Crazy Horse was a young man, he went into the Black Hills to seek his vision. He fasted for four days and four nights, took no water, and weakened his body, opening it up to a spiritual vis visitation. And he saw himself with no adornments, no fancy clothes, no war paint. He later interpreted that particular part of the vision as meaning he should never wear any fancy clothes or paint his face as he went into battle. He also, in his vision, saw himself surrounded by the Lakota people coming in on him, in part to embrace him, seemingly, to hug him, but then also to hold him as if it will be easier for the enemy to capture him. This he interprets, or excuse me, this he interprets as being both loved by his people and ultimately betrayed by his people. The last part of his vision were bullets fired at him that simply bounced off him like droplets of rain. He interprets this as, I will be invincible in battle. Nothing will hurt me. None of the white man's bullets will ever kill me. And that was Crazy Horse Vision. As a young man, Crazy Horse was also successful in counting coup. Counting coup is another Native American tradition practiced by many Native American nations and tribes. And the best way I can explain counting coup is like this. It's playing tag during a battle. So in other words, amid an actual battle where people are killing each other, you ride up to an enemy and without killing that person, tag them, literally touch them, and then leave and escape with your life. That's counting coup. The idea behind that, what probably to you sounds like a bizarre action, is that it takes more courage and more daring to go up to your enemy who's trying to kill you and tag them and get away than it is to actually kill them with a knife or a bow and arrow, a gun or whatever. That's counting coup. The last recorded case in American history of a Native American counting coup happened during World War II in Europe. There was a Native American soldier in the United States Army who got up one night literally crossed over into Nazi lines, stole a Nazi officer's horse, and touched him while he was sleeping and stole his horse. That actually happened during World War II. For Crazy Horse, counting coups successfully enabled him to become what they called a shirt wearer. Now this particular shirt, which is a leather shirt adorned with important symbols of the Oglala Lakota tribe, this would have set Crazy Horse apart as a revered and honored person in Lakota society. Being a shirt wearer meant that he was responsible to maintain the harmony of his tribe. He was also to be a leader and protector for the Lakota. The Lo Lakota describe a warrior as an individual who will be the first to go hungry and the last to eat. You are an individual who takes care of all others first and yourself last. And for that, you are worthy of admiration and respect. As a young man, Crazy Horse also fell in love. The woman's name was Black Buffalo Woman, and she fell in love with him. Black Buffalo Woman pursued Crazy Horse, and the two of them fell in love. Now, the only problem was Black Buffalo Woman was married. Now, in Lakota society, marriage between man and woman was quite common. There was a ceremony with it, but also, just like in modern 21st century America, divorce was quite common among the Lakota too. But divorce for the Lakota was much more simple and far less expensive than divorce is in current American society. How divorce worked in the, among the Lakota was like this. First of all, only a woman could divorce a man. 
the woman was in charge of the home. That was her domain. So when she no longer wanted a man to be with her, she would simply take all of his stuff and put it outside the door of their teepee. So the next time the man showed up and he sees his few belongings sitting outside the teepee, well, this was his sign that you are no longer welcome in my teepee, and another man is. I'm sure it was emotionally painful for the guy, as all divorces are to some extent, but man, is that a lot more simple than the way we do divorce today. So Black Buffalo Woman, that's what she did to her husband. She took his stuff, she set it outside the teepee, and he was out, and as soon as he's gone, in comes Crazy Horse. And they have a passionate love affair. But Black Buffalo Woman's husband, or rather her ex-husband, oh, he's very upset. He's very angry. He's very jealous. So he goes to another warrior and says, I would like to go out and hunt. But you know, I do not have a gun. May I borrow your gun, please? And so the ex-husband receives the gun. You can guess what he does with it. He doesn't go on a hunt. He goes back to the teepee of Black Buffalo Woman, walks right in, points the gun at Crazy Horse's face, pulls the trigger. Crazy Horse jerked back. The bullet tore off Crazy Horse's cheek. It's a flesh wound, but it's not a mortal wound. Crazy Horse tackles the man and gets the gun away from him. In response to this incident, the Oglala Lakota tribe blame Crazy Horse. His job as a shirt wearer was to provide harmony for the entire community. The way they saw it, when Black Buffalo Woman came up to Crazy Horse in love with him, he should have turned her away so as not to incite the rage of her husband. Crazy Horse was at fault, therefore the tribe told him he was not allowed to be a shirt wearer anymore, and he was no longer allowed to live with Black Buffalo Woman. Crazy Horse was both humiliated and heartbroken. He would spend most of the remainder of his days living outside of the tribe, by himself, independently, a bit of a loner, but always defending the Oglala Sioux against the white man. I've got a few quotes for you here. I personally find this quote fascinating. This It's not really a quote, it's a definition that the Oglala Sioux had, and the Lakota Sioux as a whole had, for what a warrior is. They define a warrior as, as an individual who is the first to go hungry and the last to eat. So they don't really define warrior necessarily as somebody who fights, but that's certainly part of what's implied with what a warrior is. But really the heart of it is somebody who serves, somebody who takes care of his people. Now, Crazy Horse is considered to be a very enigmatic figure from American history because, you know, we don't have any photographs of him. Obviously, he's Native American. He's not white American. So we have far fewer pieces of documentary evidence to know exactly what he was like and how he lived his life. But certainly the Oglala Lakota knew who he was at the time. And in the early 1930s, an individual who knew him named Black Elk who was in the 1930s himself an old man, he described what Crazy Horse was like to a, to a white ethnologist studying Lakota culture. And here's how he described Crazy Horse. He said, He was a queer man and would go about the village without noticing people or saying anything. In his own teepee, he would joke. And when he, when he, and when he was on a warpath with a small party, he would joke to make his warriors feel good. But around the village... He hardly ever noticed anybody, except little children. All the Lakotas liked to dance and sing, but he never joined a dance. And they say nobody ever heard him sing. But everybody liked him, and they would do anything he wanted or go anywhere, he said. That description of Crazy Horse comes nearly 50 years after Crazy Horse's death. Now, why and how did Crazy Horse die? Well, in order to understand that, we need to understand the story of Crazy Horse's nemesis the American military leader who led the United States Army into the Black Hills. And that individual is this man. His name was General George Armstrong Custer. The life of Custer and the life of Crazy Horse is on a collision course. These two men will meet once on the battlefield. One will win, one will lose. I say the life of Custer is just as interesting and fascinating as the life of Crazy Horse. Let's learn his story. George Armstrong Custer was born in the great state of Ohio, up in north central Ohio. 
But life in early 19th century Ohio was pretty rough for people. And sadly for Custer, his mom died when he was relatively young. His dad remarried. And so George, with his siblings, had a new extended half-family with new stepbrothers and sisters. And one of the older girls of his stepmom's family, she really became a mom to young George. He was called Audie when he was a young boy. And when she got married, she moved to Monroe, Michigan. Monroe, Michigan is a little bit south of Detroit on Lake Erie. And George was still a young guy at that time. And he followed her to live with her and her husband in their new home in Monroe, Michigan. If you go to Monroe, Michigan today, there's a big statue of Custer. Now, when he was growing up in Monroe, Michigan, he saw a girl and he fell instantly in love with this girl. Her name was Libby. Libby was probably way out of George's league. At least that's what he thought. And he spoke to her very little. He admired her from afar. They had a few interactions. She certainly knew who he was. She certainly knew that he was interested. But George Armstrong Custer, as a teenage boy, felt that he first had to make himself known as a great man before he could ever hope to pursue such a beautiful woman. So, Je so George Armstrong Custer applies and gets accepted to the prestigious West Point Military Academy in New York. And George Armstrong Custer's career at West Point is the stuff of legend. Not because he was a great student, but because he was one of the worst. Custer graduated last in his class at West Point. He was the worst student of his graduating class. And some people like to make fun of him because of this. But other people like to defend him. And here's what his defenders say. First of all, it's West Point. It's not easy. It's not easy to get in, and it's really easy to get kicked out. But he never got kicked out. He would behave poorly, he would neglect his work, and it's like he got as close to the edge of the cliff of expulsion as he could get because he kind of enjoyed being the bad boy, but he never went too far. He was always able to redeem himself. Right when he was getting ready to get kicked out, all of a sudden, he'd kick his academic energies in the fifth gear. He'd work really hard at school, he'd redeem himself, and he graduated. His teachers didn't think too much of him. But many of his fellow graduates slightly admired him for his daring and boldness. Not long after he graduated from West Point, the Civil War was on. At the Battle of Gettysburg in 18, 1863, he commanded a cavalry of men from Michigan against a much larger force that was commanded by Jeb Stuart of the Confederacy. And Custer won. He was promoted to become the youngest general in American history at age 23, and he applauded his men and gave them a nickname. Remember that this was a cavalry from Michigan? He said that we were outnumbered, but you guys, although small, are scrappy. You're small and scrappy, kind of like a wolverine. And obviously, that term, the Michigan Wolverines, stuck. And I always enjoy teaching that the mascot of the University of Michigan was given to them by a man born in Ohio. Custer was a very inspirational leader of men. First of all, he dressed the part. He had a nice uniform with a bright red sash. He had long blonde hair and a penetrating gaze. He had incredible charisma. He's the type of man that you like to look up to, that you like to follow. He sort of set his own terms. At West Point, he was nearly kicked out, but he was never kicked out. He knew how to work the system. He knew how to be daring and bold and independent. At the end of the Civil War, he's a celebrity. Many of the great commanders of the Civil War became celebrities. And there's really only two things that Custer wants to do with his celebrity status. First is to get the woman of his dreams. He goes back home and proposes to Libby. She accepts. They have a passionate love affair, and we know they had a passionate love affair because all of their letters still survive. And they're actually kept at Ohio State University. Most of the commanders during the Civil War, North and South, were married. But quite a few of them had several girlfriends on the side, not Custer. And if there's any commander who could have, it, it would have been Custer. Libby and Custer spent long periods of time apart. Custer was invited to many parties, and he was frequently surrounded by many adoring young women. But all of the historical evidence suggests 
Custer was never tempted. He loved Libby, and Libby, Libby loved him. The second thing he wanted to do with his celebrity status, and there is documentary evidence of this, he wants to become the President of the United States of America. He was a Union commander. He believes in the United States of America, but he holds in his heart a certain sympathy for the South. He feels sorry that they lost. He probably believed in the lost cause of the South. And he believes he can bring reconciliation between North and South. So this is Custer at the advent of him going out West to fight the Native Americans, to eventually make his way to the Black Hills, to clear out the Lakota so that the white settlement of the Black Hills can begin. Hopefully you've got a sense of Custer's mind. His behavior throughout his entire life is one of boldness, of daring, and man, it works for him. Everything at West Point, at Gettysburg, he acts boldly, he acts courageously, he acts independently, and he always wins. He always wins. He never lost. And now he's a celebrity. That's got to go to your head. Everybody loves him. Everybody admires him. Heck, even commanders from the Confederacy admire him. And so Custer might be a shining example of how when you never lose, when you only succeed, when you never have to endure any real hardship, when you're constantly surrounded by people who adore you, this might all go to your head. I mean, how could it not? Who could resist all that? And you might make a colossal blunder because you think, I can do no wrong and I always win. Custer wants to play an important role in creating or further creating the United States of America. Like most Americans from his background, he saw Native Americans as standing in the way of progress. That The United States of America needed to rule everything from sea to shining sea. Custer had no respect or admiration for the Native American peoples or their culture. The way he saw them, they had their time. Now their time is done. Now you could look at George Armstrong Custer and say, wow, you're a racist. You're a white supremacist. And if you think that about Custer, well, you'd be right. And I think if Custer were here today, he'd say, well, yes, white culture is superior to the Native American culture. But he would probably also look you square in the eye and tell you this. Hey, do you enjoy the fact that you're an American living in Columbus, Ohio, and you can get in your car and drive I-70 straight from Columbus, Ohio to Denver, Colorado? And you can stop along the way and get gas and eat food and sleep in a hotel, even take side trips, visit towns along the way. Well, who do you think did that for you? Who do you think made this all the United States of America? I think that's what Custer would say in response. He had a very narrow definition of what it meant to be civilized. It was a definition that he shared with a lot of other white Americans at this time. And he was willing to fight to make this vision a reality. And it's this vision and his boldness that's going to lead him directly into combat with Crazy Horse. An interesting quote I have for you from George Armstrong Custer. He said, I never wanted to be smart. I only wanted to be great. Okay, Custer is given charge of the United States 7th Cavalry. And Custer and the 7th Cavalry go to the Black Hills to protect the lives of the miners that are going into the Black Hills seeking gold. Just for what it's worth, the United States federal government did approach Red Cloud, offering to buy the Black Hills to give them money for the Black Hills. Red Cloud refused, first of all, because the United States of America had failed in delivering goods they had already promised the Lakota, and also because this is the Black Hills. Red Cloud is not going to give away the most sacred land of the Lakota. And some of the young men living on the Great Sioux Reservation escape. They run away to go to try to find Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse to join them in fighting Custer and the 7th Cavalry that's coming into the Black Hills. Now, one of the ways in which the, the white Americans were able to conquer the West was through a process of divide and conquer. Not all Native American nations got along with each other and frequently fought against each other. So there, there were some Native Americans who did not like the Lakota. And Custer hired one of them from the Crow Nation to be his scout. He needed a Native American scout to do reconnaissance, to go out into the plains to find out where Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse and their warriors were, were stationed or where they were hiding or where they were preparing to attack Custer from and to report back to him. Meanwhile, 
Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse are preparing their warriors to fight. And so Sitting Bull, in trying to decide how to prepare to deal with this crisis, the potential loss of the Black Hills, decides to go on a vision quest. And what an interesting vision quest it was. He did something called a sun dance. He went out by himself into a remote location. And he danced. While he danced, he took a knife. And he made 50 incisions into his left arm and 50 slices into his right arm. Dancing under the sun in the June of 1876. After inflicting these wounds and dancing for hours upon end, he finally passed out from exhaustion, fell down, and went into a trance. And here's what he saw. He saw a sky filled with soldiers wearing blue uniforms, thousands of them. As he described, the sky was as thick as grasshoppers. But these soldiers were all upside down, falling out of the sky, hitting the dust of the earth and disappearing. And there were none left. No more blue soldiers. When Sitting Bull pulled out of his vision, he interpreted this very positively. We're going into battle with the Americans, and we are going to win. Not long after this, Custer's scout found the camp of Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse. Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse's camp was situated along the banks of what could probably best be described as a large stream. That stream was called, is called, the Little Bighorn River. The Little Bighorn River flows into the much bigger river of the Yellowstone. After the scout spots this, he immediately goes back to Custer and reports. Custer wants to know, well, how many of them are there? His scout says, I don't know, approximately a thousand. He most likely underestimated there were most likely 2,000 Lakota and Lakota allies camped out along the banks of the Little Bighorn River. Custer has, under his command at the time, approximately 700 soldiers in the United States 7th Cavalry. Now, just like at the Battle of Gettysburg, Custer knows that he's outnumbered. Custer could easily wait, get lots of reinforcements. He knows where the Lakota are. The Lakota don't know where he is. He can get these reinforcements, go in for the kill, and win the battle. Win the battle securely. Or, without waiting for reinforcements, without waiting for other commanders, he can take his 700 men and try to do it all by himself. If you were Custer, what would you do? What do you, pre what do you assume Custer is going to do? Here is how a lifetime of luck and success and celebrity and popularity all works against Custer. Of course he's going to go for it, and he has no clue the trap he's going into. As he begins drawing his battle plans and issuing orders, his scout, who he calls Curly, starts getting rather antsy. He's looking up at the sky. He's warning Custer, don't do this, don't do this. Custer says, why not? He said, because up in the sky, there are black crows circling overhead. That's a portent of doom. It's an omen of your destruction. Custer, you're going to lose. Custer can't stand what he identifies as this native superstition, dismisses his scout. He said, if you're scared, leave. We Americans have a job to do. So in late June, 1876, General Custer is going to lead approximately 700 men from the United States 7th Cavalry against approximately 2,000 Lakota and their allies. Here was Custer's battle plan. Custer actually split up his force. This should make sense. If you're going against an encampment, and this is supposed to be a surprise attack, well, that encampment's going to see you coming. They're going to probably try to retreat as fast as possible. So as you go charging in, it would, it would be good for you if you could stave off that retreat. So he split up his forces. Under the command of a Captain Reno, several hundred of Custer's men are going to go in to block the encampment. It blocked the encampment to stop the Native Americans, the Lakota, and their allies from being able to flee in any direction. Now, of those men that Custer split up, some of them got lost. They never made it to the battle. And Reno's men were the first to see action. The Lakota knew that Custer was coming. They had their own scouts out. They knew where he was. And when Reno's men drove in first to engage the enemy, 
so that Custer could sweep around from the other side and wipe him out. The Lakota saw Reno coming. They engaged Reno and they drove Reno's men back. Custer will never know about this. He'll never know about the group of men that never made it to the battle. He never knew that Reno's men were driven back. And Custer is taking his group of men, which is approximately 270 men, in to fight approximately 2,000 Lakota warriors. Leading the Lakota warriors to fight Custer? You guessed it, Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse, the Lakota warrior. Knowing that this was Custer that he was going to face. Knowing Custer by reputation declares to his men that he must inspire to follow him into battle. Today is a good day to fight. Today is a good day to die. Brave hearts to the front, cowards to the rear. And with a whoop and a charge, Crazy Horse leads his men across the Little Bighorn, up the ridge, to surround Custer's force and take them by surprise. Crazy Horse leading men into battle wore no shirt. He didn't paint his face. Besides boots and a loincloth, the only thing he was wearing was a sacred stone that a village elder had given to him that was supposed to be imbued with special powers. He had braided that stone into his hair and wore it behind an ear. Here's an image, a map of Crazy Horse's path to surround Custer. When Custer was surrounded, there was no attempt at retreat. There was still an expectation that Captain Reno and the other men would also be showing up to engage the Lakota, but that never happened. And more and more of the Americans fell. The circle of American men became smaller and smaller, and the Lakota closed in on the general himself. So what happened? How did Custer die? Well, it's one of the great mysteries. Custer, along with his approximately 270 men that were with him at that place. They all died. The Lakota scavenged the dead American soldiers, taking guns and bullets or whatever else they could use. Custer's body was desecrated and mutilated in a wide variety of ways. Specifically, Lakota women had found Custer's body after the, after the battle. And because they considered Custer to be ignorant and hard of hearing, the Lakota women took two needles, two large sewing needles, and shoved one each into each of Custer's ears. When the American military found the remains of Custer and his men, they were naturally horrified at what they saw, and it confirmed their prejudice of Native Americans being barbaric people. And when they found Custer's body and how it had been horribly mutilated, they also discovered something else. A bullet had been shot into Custer's head. Now a lot has been made of this bullet. This bullet came from an American gun. Could it have been that a Native American, a Lakota, got an American gun and shot Custer through the head with this gun? Possible, but not probable. Could it have been that Custer, in his final moments, scared of what the Native Americans would have done to him, committed suicide. Also a possible theory, but one that fans of Custer's absolutely despise. Would this man, who had been so valiant in so many horrible situations, could he have done himself in like this? Or there's a third possibility. Knowing that if captured, Custer would have been tortured by the Lakota, one of his own men did him the favor of killing him. Now, I am no expert on the Battle of Little Bighorn. I'm simply a high school history teacher. So, really, your guess is as good as mine in terms of what happened. I've found that most people who don't like Custer are the ones that like the idea that he killed himself in the end. That is, brazen and tough as he was on the outside. In the inside, he was just as fearful and scared as anybody else, and he killed himself. Other people who just can't imagine Custer doing himself in when he'd lived a life of courage his entire life, they are more prone to believe that Custer was shot by one of his men, or possibly a Native American. But the big fact remains, the Lakota won. The Americans were killed and mutilated. And this was late June, 1876, 
the Battle of Little Bighorn. And this American loss, the news of this American loss, will be hitting the front page of every newspaper in the United States of America not but several days before the 4th of July. And not just any 4th of July, the centennial. This is 1876. What do you think the American response to this is going to be on the centennial of our birthday? Hey, so the Battle of Little Bighorn took place in what is today southern Montana. It's a national park site today. Here's an image of it. Check out that big blue Montana sky. There are the grave markers of the Americans who died in battle. They're still buried there. Those memorials go all the way back to the 19th century. Is there a Lakota memorial there? After all, Lakota died in this battle as well. Yes, there is, but it wasn't put up until the early 21st century. The Lakota won this battle, but they know that the joy of winning this battle is going to be very short-lived. George Custer didn't wait for those reinforcements. but They know the full power of the United States military. And when the United States public finds out in no uncertain terms exactly what happened to those American soldiers at Little Bighorn, there will be screams to send the United States military out to kill the Lakota. And how will the Lakota fight now? Do Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse have what it takes to continue to fight these battles? When now they're not going to be facing a few hundred, but rather tens of thousands of American soldiers. So here are two Native American warriors from 1876, one of which you know, the other one you don't. Sitting Bull and Chief Joseph. They both had different responses to the Battle of Little Bighorn. The first was Sitting Bull's. Sitting Bull felt a duty to protect his people, and he knew what was coming. He knew that the Battle of, the, of Little Bighorn meant death for his people. So he wanted to get his people out of the United States of America, and that meant going north to Canada. So for those willing to follow him, they simple, simply traveled up north, north of Montana Territory. They crossed the border, and they go into Canada. When they got there and they set up camps, they were greeted by Canadian Mounties. And the Canadian Mounties told Sitting Bull, you are allowed to be here. Canada welcomes you. You are allowed to live here. But what you are not allowed to do is to use this as a base from which you can launch attacks against the United States Army. Because if you do that, that will draw Canada and the United States into a possible war. If you attempt to attack the Americans from Canada, we will kick you out or we will arrest you and hand you over to the American authorities. Sitting Bull and his people accept these terms. But what they couldn't accept was the Canadian winter. It was bitterly cold. The winter of 1876 into 1877, Sitting Bull's people didn't show up with the provisions to be able to survive. They had nothing to trade. They had no money to buy things. Eventually, Sitting Bull's people started leaving Sitting Bull's camp, going to live on the shrinking reservation of the Lakota people in modern-day South Dakota. Sitting Bull himself will eventually return to the United States of America to surrender. We'll learn more about his story later. Then there was Chief Joseph, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce. I haven't said anything about Chief Joseph before. I'm not going to say anything after uh, about him after this. Chief Joseph is famous for this one speech and this one line that simply captures this moment in Native American history. He mourns the fact that so many people who he know or he knew who or who he knew are now dead. Some have died in battle, others are starving to death. Native American cultures are being decimated. There's nothing left to fight for, and so he declares, "I am tired. My heart is sick and sad from where the sun now stands." I will fight no more forever. And that phrase, I will fight no more forever, seems to capture the attitude of most Native Americans at this time after the Battle of Little Bighorn, a battle that they won, but they know that this victory is provoking a response in the United States of America that they will not be able to deal with. Now, of the warriors who were present at the Battle of Little Bighorn, there was one that continued to refuse to surrender. And you guessed it, that was Crazy Horse. 
Crazy Horse and his followers, simply disappeared. They went off into the mountains, attempting to survive in a bitter, cold climate, very similar to Sitting Bull's people. Sitting Bull had run away to a cold latitude and was freezing up there. Crazy Horse and his followers had gone to a cold altitude and they were freezing in the mountains. Going into 1877, he's watching people starve, in particular, women and young children, and it's breaking Crazy Horse's heart. There's nothing to scavenge, no food to eat, nobody to trade with. So completely desperate and totally out of options. Crazy Horse still refuses to surrender, but he does go for help. He rides his horse to Fort Lincoln, Nebraska. He approaches the fort without his gun. The United States soldiers who see him take him in, trying to figure out who he is and what he wants. Nobody has ever seen a picture of Crazy Horse. They only know vague descriptions of him, and Crazy Horse doesn't speak English. Within the military encampment, a translator is found. But in all likelihood, this translator probably did not fully understand Lakota. The translator was able to figure out, this is Crazy Horse. That caused a stir. Crazy Horse is asking for food for his people. There was probably miscommunication about what Crazy Horse was requesting and what the American soldiers were saying in response. Crazy Horse was then escorted into a building. While they are walking to this building, an American soldier has his gun with bayonet affixed pointed at Crazy Horse's back. As Crazy Horse approaches the building, he looks at the window and he sees bars. Crazy Horse interprets this. This is a jail. I'm getting locked up. And so he holds out his hands and affixes them on the door frame so that nobody can push him in. But the American soldier walking behind Crazy Horse with his bayonet affixed to his gun, either intentionally or accidentally, stabs Crazy Horse through the kidney. Crazy Horse, weakened and starving, falls over. He was brought into that room. His body was put down on a cot where it took him a couple of days to die. After his death, other Lakota showed up requesting the body. And the rest here is a little bit of speculation and legend. The Oglala Lakota took the body of Crazy Horse. They took it into the Black Hills. They buried it in a secret location that very few people know about. As generations have passed between the 19th century and the 21st century, only certain special, exclusive members of the Oglala Lakota Nation know the specific hidden location of the gravesite of Crazy Horse. After the Battle of Little Bighorn, the death of Crazy Horse, and the capture of Sitting Bull, there was a sharp decline in the conflicts between Native American nations and the United States government. And as more white Americans spread westward, and as more Native Americans tried to adapt to the reservation lifestyle, it's almost immediately at this point that you have the creation of the myth of the Wild West that will influence historians and the popular Im American imagination alike. And nobody is more responsible for this creation of the mythology of the West, of cowboys and Indians, of shootouts in Wild West towns, than this man. This is Buffalo Bill Cody. We've learned about him before. He acquired immense wealth and immense fame in the 1870s by being a buffalo killer, or I guess, I guess I should say more properly, a bison killer. And really, Buffalo Bill could be understood as a great entrepreneur in American history. He's a celebrity, he's a very wealthy, self-made man, and he's a guy who comes up with an idea to make even more money, a lot more money, and enhance his celebrity to be worldwide making him one of the most famous people of the 19th century. All right, so what does he do? Well, he does this. He created a traveling show. He became an entertainer. 
Think of it like a circus, but without the animals. But you still have the tent and the bleachers, and it moves around from town to town to town. But instead of animals on parade performing tricks, you had cowboys, and you had Native Americans. And the cowboys would ride around the tent, and they would lasso bulls and pull them in. They'd perform shooting tricks. They would reenact events from the Wild West, like, say, the shootout at the OK Corral in Tombstone, Arizona. You know, all of these major events were things that people in the East, in places like Columbus, Ohio, where we had read about this stuff, and we'd heard about this stuff, but now we can see it enacted by Buffalo Bill and real cowboys who are actually from the West. And so Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, which was a traveling show, became one of the most popular entertainment events of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And what a sweet gig from Buffalo for Buffalo Bill and all of his friends. They got to leave the Wild West, which, as exciting as it was, as you get older, sort of just want some security in your life. You don't want to worry about getting shot by an outlaw. That's not as exciting as it is at age 35 as it is at age maybe 19. And so you get to travel around, you get to put on performances, you get to become a national celebrity, you even get to travel internationally. Buffalo Bill's Wild West show toured Europe, and Buffalo Bill himself met the Queen of England, Queen Victoria. What a life, right? And of all the people who toured with Buffalo Bill, there were two in this traveling entertainment group that were also very popular. The first is Annie Oakley. Annie Oakley was very popular for two very clear reasons. One, she's one of the greatest sharpshooters in American history. Two, she's a female. Now, also in the late 19th century, the motion picture camera had been invented by Thomas Edison, and we actually have some film footage of Annie Oakley that we see captured here. Now, I'm sure Americans would be in awe of any great sharpshooter, but the fact that it was a great female sharpshooter made her even more popular. Here's a picture of Annie Oakley that was taken in the year 1908 in Upper Arlington, Ohio. Now, Upper Arlington doesn't technically exist until the year 1918, so we're 10 years away from that. But this is Annie Oakley at the Columbus Gun Club, which was actually situated on the north side of Fifth Avenue in what would today be Upper Arlington. What's interesting about this photograph is that it is an informal shot. Most of the pictures that we see of Annie Oakley have her dressed up like a cowgirl. Here she is in a regular dress. And we've also got some cultural diffusion in this photograph because she's wearing a Native American beaded bag around her waist. You can also see that there's a rack of guns in the background. All right, so Annie Oakley was a very popular entertainment entertainer that was part of Buffalo Bill's Wild West traveling show. And this was the other individual, Sitting Bull. Yes, that Sitting Bull. The Lakota that had visions in it during his Sundance, the Lakota that was present at the Battle of Little Bighorn, considered to be one of the greatest Native American warriors of all time. He too was tired of life in the West and wanted some, some security in his life. But obviously, his reasons for wanting to leave the West were, were different from the white cowboys that joined the show. So during Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, they would have cowboy and Indian fights. And of course, the Native Americans, the Indians, they would always be the bad guys. And they would do violent and militia things. They'd probably have a reenactment of the Battle of Little Bighorn or something like that. And it was a tragic killing of the uh, of the American 7th Cavalry and the death of Custer and the crowd would boo and resentment towards the Native Americans would build. Now when they did these reenactments, I do not think Sitting Bull participated in any of that. He simply presented himself before the crowd. Here he is, Sitting Bull. You've heard of him, you've read about him, and now here he is in front of your eyes. So Sitting Bull got to travel all around the United States of America. He got to travel to Europe. He, too, met the Queen of England, Queen Victoria. And on these tours, Sitting Bull plummeted into deep depression because he saw the future of the United States. He saw the future of his land. Sitting Bull saw 
Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Boston, New York City. Buffalo Bill's Wild West show also came to Columbus, Ohio multiple times over the course of a couple of decades. Likely, Sitting Bull saw our town, too. And he realized this is the future. There are so many Americans. They have so many resources. Our native, tribal, traditional way of life is doomed. So even though Sitting Bull acquired some wealth and celebrity near the end of his life, and here's a picture of him and Buffalo Bill standing together, posing for an advertisement photograph, even though he acquired wealth and celebrity at the end of his life, it really did nothing for his happiness. I mean, I don't know if you're Sitting Bull or any of the Lakota at this point in time after 1876, what you do, realizing that your traditional way of life is being destroyed and that most of your people have moved on to a reservation, no longer allowed to move around the plains or hunt like you traditionally did, but instead are dependent upon government handouts that come to you at a Bureau of Indian Affairs government post in places like Wounded Knee and Pine Ridge on the Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. It just was a tragic story, and it helps explain why so many Native Americans beginning in the late 19th century just felt a sense of renunciation, and many of them turned to alcohol. There is today no longer any Great Sioux Reservation, but rather the original Great Sioux Reservation, which took up what would be today the whole western half of South Dakota, was divided up into several smaller reservations. And when I first started teaching in the early 2000s, I learned that the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota had the largest percentage of alcoholism than any county in the United States of America. Now, that was in the early 2000s. I don't know if this is still true today, but I, was, I would assume it would be likely similar since there have been no great changes that I know of to eradicate that alcoholism. And if you know your history, you know why those high rates of alcoholism exist on those Native American reservations. Sitting Bull eventually quit the Wild West show and went back to the reservation. And while he was there, a particular movement developed called the Ghost Dance. And the Ghost Dance that we'll learn about here in just a moment, you will learn was literally just a dance that Native Americans began doing, and they began doing it for long periods of time. And the United States military that were stationed on the reservation, they thought that a an insurrection was somehow developing, that this was the beginning of a, of a, of a war. And they thought because of Sitting Bull's prestige and who he represented that he might be behind it. There was absolutely no evidence of this. It's just that the American authorities suspected, well, maybe Sitting Bull's behind this. So Sitting Bull's life comes to an extraordinarily tragic end because here's what happens. The United States authorities that were present on all of the reservation had hired Native Americans to help them police the reservations. So there were Lakota on the Lakota reservations that were working for the United States government as essentially law enforcement officers. So on the reservation where Sitting Bull was, the American authorities asked for some of the Lakota policemen to go and to round up Sitting Bull and to bring him in. And when they did this, Sitting Bull was very upset. There was some sort of scuffle and Sitting Bull was shot by a Native American policeman working for the United States authorities. And Sitting Bull dies. Guys, there are very few happy endings for the Native Americans in the late 19th century. It's tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. Even this, the Black Hills, the Pahasapa, the heart of all that is, what happened to them? Well, here's what happened to them. If you can look at your screen right now, here are the Black Hills today. If you're just listening to this lecture and not able to see the screen, what we see here in, 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 in the Black Hills today are huge holes in the earth where gold has been mined. For the Lakota, this is the greatest insult because this is the most sacred place on earth. 
there are still many, many beautiful spots in the Black Hills today, but you also have these gigantic holes in the earth from which a lot of gold was extracted, but it's left behind this horrible eyesore. And then here's something else that's also a very popular tourist destination in the Black Hills today. Mount Rushmore. This was made during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Here we have, chiseled out of the side of one of the hills in the Black Hills, the faces of four very popular American presidents, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. For many people, this is an inspirational homage to four great American leaders. But hopefully you can understand how for the Lakota, this is an incredible insult. Of all the hills and the mountains in the United States of America, why did this have to be carved in the Black Hills? Now for me, personally, what I find very hard to understand was the Native American response to Mount Rushmore. That response was to carve another mountain with one of their own heroes, and they wanted to outdo Mount Rushmore by making their mountain carving more three-dimensional. So take a moment here to think, all right, if you're a Lakota and you would like to sculpt the image of a hero out of a mountain in the Black Hills, which hero are you going to choose? And there might be a couple that pop up into mind. And if you chose Crazy Horse, you would be correct. So here's the Crazy Horse monument in the Black Hills. This is the way it looks today. As you can tell, it is incomplete. We have the face of Crazy Horse on the monument, and that's just about all. This project was begun in the 1940s when the Lakota Nation hired one man to begin the process of sculpting Crazy Horse out of a monument. The Lakota people provided his salary and the money he needed for his materials from completely private contributions. That man worked on this monument for several decades, then he died. Work still continues on the monument, but progress is obviously slow. This has been going on for decades. Here's what the final work is supposed to look like. We're to have Crazy Horse sitting on his horse. This monument is along the periphery of the Black Hills, and Crazy Horse is pointing inwards to the center of the Black Hills. Here's a detail of Crazy Horse's face, the only completed part of the monument today. Okay, so in this story of repeated injuries of, against the Native Americans, you might wonder, were there any white people in the United States of America who attempted to stand up for the rights of the Native Americans? Well, yes, there were. And this is perhaps one of the most famous. Her name was Helen Hunt Jackson. She was a sociologist, an anthropologist, a writer, a novelist. She was one of the great female writers of the late 19th century, and get this, she grew up in Am Amherst, Massachusetts, and her close friend as a girl was another girl named Emily Dickinson, who's one of the greatest poets of American history. For me, it's a great irony of history that Helen Hunt Jackson and Emily Dickinson grew up together. Okay, but who is Helen Hunt Jackson? Well, Helen Hunt Jackson was a woman who traveled and spent a lot of time with Native American nations in the West. And she showed up, she, ing she ingratiated herself to each tribe, she spoke with them, and she collected their stories. And you can read the stories of all of these tribes in her book, A Century of Dishonor. It's essentially an American history book from the late 18th to the late 19th century. The book was, pu was published in the year 1881, approximately you know, at our centennial or a few years after our centennial. So here is a white American woman who spent a lot of time with Native peoples and developed a strong sense of disgust with what her country had done. And she strongly believed that some sort of reparations were necessary. So what she did was she took a bunch of copies of her book. She went to Washington, D.C., and she placed a copy of the book on the desk of every congressman and every senator. And on the front page, she personally inscribed, look at your hands, they are covered in blood, thus trying to shame Congress into taking some sort of action. 
Well, did Congress take any action? Well, it is at this time that Congress is starting to act and pass legislation that they believe will help the Native Americans. It probably was not in response to this book, but they are doing things to try to help the Native Americans. Now, we will briefly learn about what they, what, what, what Congress is doing, and you can judge for yourself if this is actually helping the Native Americans or if it's hurting them. Helen Hunt Jackson also wrote popular works of fiction. This is one of the most famous to capture what life was like for the indigenous people of the West. And even though this was a work of fiction, this is her most famous work of fiction, it's called Ramona, it is actually based on the real life experience of one of the women that Helen Hunt Jackson met during her travels throughout the West. A Ramona Lubo was her name. And she was of mixed ancestry. Her family was both Mexican and Native American. Okay, so I mentioned that Congress in the late 1870s and throughout the 1880s was trying to do was trying to do something to help the Native Americans. And one of the most famous laws or acts that they passed was the Dawes Severality Act of 1887. Okay, so here's what Congress is thinking in Washington, D.C. Let's learn about their logic and their way of thinking, and then let's think of the impact of the Dawes Severality Act. Okay, so for Congress, they want to help Native Americans. And the way they see they can help Native Americans so that they too can be like immigrants, they can be absorbed into the American way of life, they pass this Dawes Severality Act, which does this. It ends the tribal system. The Dawes Act will take Native American land and divide it up into specific plots of land that Native American families can individually homestead. So in other words, Native Americans, in order for you to have a bright future, you need to learn how to become like the rest of America. You're going to have a plot of land that'll be yours. It'll be given to you for free. You will learn property ownership. You will learn how to farm. You will therefore for learn capitalism. And once you become familiar with this way of life, well, then you too will be an American citizen. So this is your opportunity given to you by the United States federal government. Okay, so there you go. The Dawes Severality Act of 1887. So is this good? Well, you're getting land. You're being provided with an opportunity to make money and be successful in American society. So that sounds good. And from and for Congress's perspective, that is good. Is there anything bad about it? Well, yes, of course there's something bad about it. It's continuing to destroy the traditional native way of life, which is tribal. This destroys the tribes. And most people today look upon the Dawes Severality Act of 1887 as really being a legislative act of cultural supremacy. Congress could have done more to help the Native Americans protect their traditional way of life as best they could on the reservation, but they didn't. It was like, let's divide up the reservations now. This didn't happen to all of them, it happened in some specific places, but let's have Native Americans learn how to be like Americans. Now, to put this within the greater context of American history, this is the late 19th century. There's a surge of immigration that's coming in from mostly Southern and Eastern Europe, as well as Central Europe. Much of my own personal family was immigrating to the United States at this time, almost exactly at this time, the late 1880s is when you know, the indresses that I'm related to immigrated over here from Central Europe. And these immigrants were expected to you know, show up, learn how to speak English, learn how to get a job, buy a home, and become typical Americans. And, it was, and, and Congress thought, well, the Native Americans should do this too, and we're going to help them. And that was the Dawes Severality Act. Now, along with the Dawes Severality Act, came money to help finance schools in which to educate Native American children, one of which was in central rural Pennsylvania, in the city of Carlisle, Pennsylvania, there was the Carlisle School. Now, central Pennsylvania is a long way away from South Dakota, and these schools were run by individuals 
who, from a certain perspective, you could argue genuinely cared about Native Americans, but also had no respect for traditional American culture. They saw their job as, we're going to save these young kids, these young boys and girls, by teaching them how to become American. So they had a phrase, kill the Indian to save the child. So these school administrators would go to today South Dakota, they would go to the reservations and they would ask parents if they wanted to send their children with them. And they would teach them the white way of life, thus providing them at a very young age with the opportunity to survive in modern American society. And for those families who agreed, their children were taken. And if you're able to look at the screen right now, you see the transition that these Native American children would go through. They would have their Native American dress taken away, their hair would be cut if they were a boy, and understand the significance of that. If you are a Native American man, traditionally, you don't cut your hair. You have long hair. The only time you cut your hair is when you are in mourning. So if somebody that you love dies, then you cut your hair. So already having your hair cut, that is symbolic for being very sad. Then you would not be able to use your name. You would be given a typical American name like Charlie or Susan or Joe. And you would, of course, not be able to speak anything but English. You would learn how to eat American food. You would learn American history from the white American's point of view. And the goal of this is, of course, to... Quote, kill the Indian to save the child. But these are children. Imagine if this was you, if you were first grade age, second grade age, being removed from your family, sent hundreds of miles away. Everything that's familiar to you is taken away from you. These children suffered extreme anxiety. Common for children that experience this type of trauma is consistent bedwetting, even at an older age, like 9, 10, 11 and they would be disciplined for this too. Going to the Carlisle School or a school like it would have been extraordinarily traumatizing for a Native American child. Now, a couple years after the Dawes Severality Act of 1887, more land is going to be taken away from Native Americans and divided up, this time not for Native Americans, but for American citizens, white Americans. The Indian Territory, located directly north of Texas, had been a very large territory reserved for Native Americans going all the way back to the Trail of Tears in the early 19th century. It was one large reservation. The Indian Appropriations Act of 1889 eliminated the Indian Territory as a whole and forced the Native Americans who were living there onto much smaller reservations contained within the Indian Indian Territory. The Indian Territory was going to be settled by whites. It would soon thereafter become a state, and that state would be called Oklahoma. Now, the white settlement of the Indian Territory of Oklahoma on April the 22nd, 1889, caused quite a stir. Once again, government is giving away land for free. And this ended up being, quite literally, a race. So no white Americans were allowed into Oklahoma prior to noon of April 22nd, 1889. If you were interested in claiming land, you showed up to a particular government post that would be located somewhere along the border. You would literally be given a stake with a flag on it. And on high noon, April 22nd, 1889, everybody's turned loose. You're on your horse. If you're with your your family, maybe have a wagon and you go into the Indian territory and you find an area that's yours and you put down your stake and you literally stake your claim. And then that was your land to try to farm. Now, famously, there were some people who didn't want to play fair. They didn't want to wait till noon of April 22nd, but rather they decided to go early. They just tried, they decided to sneak into Oklahoma and, and find the good spot, probably next to a stream or a river that was, which would have soil that was well irrigated so you could become a more successful farmer. And, you know, you didn't want to compete for it. So these people who snuck in too soon and got away with it were therefore called Sooners, which of course 
goes on to become the mascot of the University of Oklahoma. And some of you may be familiar with like University of Oklahoma football games where before the game they've got, you know, people in a covered wagon being drawn by horses riding all around the football field, you know, whatever. <laughs> and for me, I find this to be a very interesting mascot. A Sooner is a cheater. Now, if you weren't a Sooner, if you actually went on noon on April 22nd, you were part of the boom. So therefore you were a boomer. People who went early were the cheaters. They were the Sooners. And the University of Oklahoma decided to proudly take as their mascot the cheaters, the Sooners. So good to know. The year after the Boomers and the Sooners of Oklahoma, back up north in South Dakota, we have the final tragedy that I talk about. And in the way that most historians and history teachers tell the stories of uh, the story of the Native Americans in the 19th century, most mark this particular event as the last big final catastrophe. And this was the massacre at Wounded Knee in December of 1890. Sometimes it's referred to as the Battle of Wounded Knee. That's how it was originally referred to, but that would be an incorrect word to use. There was no battle. This was a, this was a massacre. This was the killing of innocent, unarmed people. And here's what happened. So you know that the Great Sioux Reservation that was established in 1868 with Chief Red Cloud no longer exists. After the discovery of gold in the Black Hills, the Battle of Little Bighorn, white people are settling this part of modern day South Dakota. There are big cities there like Rapid City, South Dakota and Custer, South Dakota, named after the general. The big reservation was broken down into smaller reservations one of them being the Pine Ridge Reservation. And this is where the Oglala Sioux lived. If you remember the Oglala Sioux, these are crazy horses people. In each of these reservations, there would essentially be, I guess what you could consider a small town. It would be a government post. And it would be here that the government would distribute money, food, other supplies besides groceries would be sold in this area. Probably the easiest way to think of this is it was a welfare distribution area. And this government post, this small town in the Pine Ridge Res Reservation was Wounded Knee. It would also be at these government posts where you'd have the United States military stationed. So you would have soldiers there for the protection of the Native Americans, but really it's also there to stop any future type of uprising by the Native Americans. And probably not coincidentally, the regiment stationed at Wounded Knee on the Pine Ridge Reservation was the 7th Cavalry. So these would be the soldiers that took the place of all the men that died at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And they're there, quote unquote, protecting some of the Native Americans who may have actually been participants at the Battle of Little Bighorn, but more likely their widowed wives and children. Okay, so that's the place, that's the situation. Now, what started happening in 1890 was something called the Ghost Dance Movement. The Ghost Dance is literally a dance. It was a, a dance that developed in the American Southwest. It did not develop in South Dakota. It developed in Arizona. But it spread among all of the Native Americans. It was extraordinarily popular. And as I describe the dance to you, hopefully it becomes very clear why this dance became popular. The Native Americans have been repeatedly humiliated and are being forced to live on reservations. Their traditional way of life is a memory. They now live in an extraordinarily sad state. How do you ever overcome that humiliation? Well, you can do the ghost dance. To do the ghost dance, you first need a shirt. You make your own shirt. Stitching onto this shirt symbols that are personally meaningful to you, your family, and your tribe. You complete making your shirt in preparation for the ghost dance, and then you and the rest of your tribe or whoever you're with, you get together, Tribal drums are rhythmically beaten. You dance together. You sing together. You do this for hours upon hours 
upon hours. You deprive yourself of food, drink, or rest. Listening to those drum beats, dancing in sync, or dancing in sync with those drum beats for hours upon end, you finally entrance yourself. And when you are entranced, you see your ancestors, your parents, your grandparents, your distant ancestors, and you have a vision of a pre-Columbian North America, a North America where there were only Native Americans, a North America where the traditional way of life not only survived, but it was vibrant and it was the only way of life. And you had this vision. And while you were amid this vision, you were like crazy horse, immune to the white man's bullets. They couldn't kill you while you were doing the ghost dance. And so that's what the ghost dance was. And hopefully you understand why it's called the ghost dance. The word ghost there isn't supposed to be spooky. It probably could be better understood as the dance with our ancestors, but it was the dance with the dead, the ghost dance. Now, from the perspective of the Seventh Cavalry, when they saw this ghost dance starting to happen, they didn't quite understand it. Everybody banging these drums all day, all night, the, the Oglala Sioux dancing all day, all night, singing their songs, it just made the 7th Cavalry antsy. They thought something was up. They feared some sort of insurrection. So they decided to make sure that there was, that, that there was no revolution brewing. They decided to go into the, into the reservation and to collect all of the guns. So if we just strip them of their guns and they have no guns, then they can't start a revolution. They can't rise up to fight us again. So in comes the 7th Cavalry to start plucking the guns away from all of the Oglala Sioux. It is while they are doing that, that some sort of scuffle occurs. There is a legend that one of the soldiers in the 7th Cavalry tried to take the gun away from a man. He was telling him, give me your gun, but that particular man, that, that Oglala Sioux was deaf, didn't understand what was being said and held tightly to his gun, and that gun discharged. That may have been what happened. We don't know. All we know is that there was a scuffle. The 7th Cavalry removed themselves from the Oglala Sioux, and then they turned guns and even cannon upon the defenseless people, and they slaughtered them. Now remember that because of all this warfare, there were very few men that were actually there. You're mostly talking about elderly people, women, young children. And when the firing began, most of these people did exactly what you would do. They turned and they ran. They grabbed children and they took off. And the 7th Cavalry pursued them, shooting them down. Approximately 200 women and children were killed. Approximately 50 women and children were injured. Afterwards, the United States military took pictures of, of many of the dead, including this man who was frozen in the snow after being shot. His name was Chief Bigfoot. He was a shaman. Here's a picture of the bodies lying in the snow. It was late December of 1890 in South Dakota. Notice that their teepees have been burned. And here's the Native Americans being buried in a mass grave by the United States 7th Cavalry. Here's another, albeit grainy, photograph of soldiers from the United States 7th Cavalry posing by the dead. The Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890 is considered to be the end of the conflicts between the Native Americans and the United States federal government, or at least the end of the military conflicts. There will actually be another very significant uprising among the Laglala Sioux in this exact same spot in the Pine Ridge Reservation and the city of Wounded Knee, but that will not happen until the year 1973. The year 1890 is considered to be a turning point. And that's just because of the Battle of Wounded Knee. 
something else happened in the year 1890. 1890 was the beginning of a new decade, of course. And at the beginning of every new decade, we take the census. This was established by the United States Constitution. We simply count how many people we have in the United States of America so that we can have a fair number of representatives from each state in the House of Representatives in Congress. It's also just important for general data collection. We know how many people there are, where they're living, etc. And the data collection for the 1890 census was important because we had been spreading westward. America was growing. And once all of that data was collected and published, it was studied by a history professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. His name was Frederick Jackson Turner. And he looked at the data of the 1890 census and he concluded that this represents the end of an epic in American history. He declared there is no frontier left. Enough of North America has been settled by the Americans. There is now no place left that can be called an unsettled frontier. And for him, this is big news because going all the way back to the settling of Jamestown in 1607, going all the way back to the settling of Massachusetts by the Pilgrims in 1620, the concept of what it means to be an American. Part of the American identity is this. If you don't like the way things are, if you're too poor, if you're scared of the tyranny of the law where you're living, you've always got someplace to go. And that place is West. Throughout American history, from its dawn to the year 1890, there was always some place to run away to. Some place where you could be independent and free. Some place where you could try to survive by your own wits. And he says in his essay that he writes about this, published and presented in the year 1893, called The Frontier Thesis, that the existence of the frontier has defined the American character. The American character has been created by pioneers who left the safety and security of civilization going to a wild and civilized place, either as an individual or in groups, where you were forced to survive, either by yourself or in a new group, in an unknown land. You had to deal with hostile weather. You had to deal with hostile Native Americans. And it was these daring, bold, rugged pioneers that created the American character because they did constantly venture west and settle west. And they built towns with schools and banks and grocery stores and churches and everything else. And life became settled after that. After that, then the next generation of kids growing up, they don't have to be pioneers. They go to school, they get educated, they get jobs, and they live a much more relaxed and safe lifestyle than their pioneer ancestors. And now, after the year 1890, Frederick Jackson Turner argues every future generation in the United States is now going to grow up, none of them pioneers. They're all going to grow up in the safety and the security of civilization. They're not going to have to rely upon their own wits to survive. They're going to rely upon the law. They're going to rely upon some business giving them a job. And this, he argues, is going to change the American character, and not for the better. Frederick Jackson Turner argues that growing up amid this safety and security will not make us better people, but in fact, make us weaker, not just physically weaker, but mentally, emotionally, and morally weaker. And the only thing to save us would be if we can find now after 1890, some sort of new frontier. Frederick Jackson Turner published his frontier thesis in the year 1893. It was also in the, in the year 1893 that Chicago, which was a growing, booming city in the year 1893, hosted the World's Fair. And there's a lot that went on in the World's Fair of 1893. The whole thing was lit up with Thomas Edison's electrical light bulb. So we had lights on all night. That was an incredibly new thing. 
Famously, there was a mass murderer. I'm sorry, mass murder is the incorrect term. There was a serial killer that was on the loose capturing and killing beautiful women. If you're interested in that story, the historian Eric Larson wrote a popular history book called The Devil in the White City, which is about that killer. Some people think that man is the exact same man as Jack the Ripper, who was a serial killer of women in London, England. But it was there at the Chicago's fair, at the Chicago or the World Fair in Chicago, that Frederick Jackson Turner presented his frontier thesis. And it's captivated Americans ever since. And you can wonder for yourself, are we better people now that all of North America has been settled by the Americans, or at least, you know, in between Canada and Mexico, we've settled all of this. We now have states and counties and towns. We've preserved parks but there's no frontier to go into. I mean, think of it like this. If you were growing up in Ohio in the 1860s and you didn't like your family, your school, whatever, you could run away. I mean, that's a possibility. You could just up sticks, run away and leave, but you're gonna have to make it on your own. You're gonna have to find your own food. You have to be able to protect yourself, but I mean, you could live like Billy the Kid out in the desert. And people like Billy the Kid did stuff like that. Now, you still can run away from home, I guess, but there's no frontier to run away to. You know, you're going to have to hide out in the city somewhere. But on the frontier, you could change your name. You could attempt to establish yourself. You could create a whole town. But you had to have the gumption and the smarts to do it. Turner says we don't have that anymore. And because we don't have that anymore, our country is going to become weak. And most importantly, he argues we're going to become a more immoral people. We're going to become less good. So this idea has fascinated people and historians throughout American history. I'll let you judge for yourself. As a country, are we better or are we worse for not having this frontier exist in American history? What do you think? Well, to wrap this up, I will tell you there was one person who wasn't present at the Chicago Fair in 1893 to listen to Frederick Jackson Turner read his thesis aloud, but this man read the Frontier Thesis in 1893 and was very taken by it and actually wrote Frederick Jackson Turner saying he was spot on and that Americans need a new frontier. And that man was Theodore Roosevelt, who nine years later would become the president of the United States of America. All right, that's it, guys. Hey, but before I wrap up, I do have a few books here that I want to mention. If you're interested in any of some of the stuff that I talked about throughout these two lectures, here's some good books. If you're interested in the lives of women in the West or in the lives of women at any point in time in American history, this is a great, easy to read book. It's called America's Women, 400 Years of Dolls, Drudges, Helpmates, and Heroines. It's written by a woman named Gail Collins. She's a great historian. She's a great writer. This book was published in the early 2000s. It's still fairly new. I think you'll like it. And it's one of these books you can turn to a particular chapter which, and focus on any era in American history, you know, like the 1920s, 1970s, you know, the Wild West, and, and you'll get a really good vivid description of how women had to live at this particular point in time in history. Also, about a little bighorn, if you're interested in an in-depth biography of uh, Crazy Horse or Custer, well, then why not read Crazy Horse and Custer? the dual biography of two American warriors by the great American historian Stephen E. Ambrose. And then lastly, this is considered to be a classic of American literature. A man by the name of John Nyhart went to the Pine Ridge Reservation in the 1930s, the early 1930s, and he met an, a, a Lakota elder by the name of Black Elk. And Black Elk told John Nyhart his story, and Nyhart wrote it down in his own words in Black Elk's own words. And Black Elk, as a young man, knew Crazy Horse. So if you're interested in Lakota culture, their belief system, their vision quests, their feelings toward the Black Hills, as well as the story of who Crazy Horse actually was, Black Elk Speaks is a fantastic work of literature. You have a very eloquent, very descriptive Native American history that's presented in this relatively short book, probably about 200, 250 pages. All right, and those are three great books if you're interested. And hey, this concludes the second and final lecture on Western expansionism. Thanks for listening. Thanks for paying attention. 
Hope you'll learn something. Have a great day, United States history students.